everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Priya Kataria. I work as an Instruction and Learning Design Manager at the Owl House Goa. I also specialize in clinical psychology and child rights and have worked with leading nonprofits in United States and in India. With me is my colleague Vivian Vaz. Vivian is a learning facilitator at the Owl House and specializes in early intervention and free learning skills. Vivian is also an alumni at University of Wales, UK, and she has worked with a residential school in Pennsylvania, USA. We are very excited to be part of Autism Connect and be a resource to an amazing audience that we have today. Thank you for joining us. In today's webinar, we would be doing a brief discussion on three topics. Topic one is setting up your space. Topic two is teaching strategies. Topic three is evaluating progress. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about the Owl House. Owl House is a community service initiative under the Able Tree Foundation. The services we provide are directed towards the youth with neurological differences, primarily with autism spectrum conditions. Our vision is to ensure better futures for everyone by enabling individuals with special needs to become integrated members of the community while working with the community to create more work opportunities to promote better and more meaningful lives for everyone. We have found that the best way to do this is to equip our students with hands-on professional skills that will allow them to be involved in productive work. Education that is structured, data-driven and comprehensively evaluated is not easily available for people with special needs and that is precisely the problem we are looking to solve. We strongly believe that learning can be engaging and fun when it is designed to suit the, learning, the learner's abilities and preferences. Our long-term goal would be to establish India's first higher education space for people with neurological differences. Because we were closed due to the lockdown, our team has moved entirely online and has started a learn at home page for our students and families. Our facilitators and mentors have created captivating content to engage our students and help our parents during this time in addition to the ongoing regular online sessions. Now, during these uncertain times, owing to the coronavirus, many of you might have been many of you might have been feeling an additional responsibility of homeschooling, which can be daunting if you haven't done it in the past or don't know where to begin. You may need some help with setting up your space, structuring your day, or teaching concepts and skills. Today, we'll be sharing with you some tips to navigate in this situation. Believe it or not. Home is just as important to a child's education as a school. There is a lot of learning that happens within your walls, so do not discreet the instruction that happens at home every day. While every child is different when it comes to their needs, some individuals learn differently from others. And it is important to recognize these differences so that you create a tailor-made program for your child. As parents, you know your child's best and you therefore can help them learn to learn in his or her own way, which is best suited for their needs. However, there are some key strategies that can be utilized, which may be very, very useful for establishing a learning space at home. Let's look into one of them. Today, we'll be talking about setting up your space for work and play. There are many benefits to homeschooling. For one, it is flexible. It can be personalized to your child's interest, which can help build confidence, reduce anxiety, and possibly a higher success rate in learning. Creating a dedicated space for your child to work can help them concentrate at work at hand. And it can also help your child to differentiate work and playtime. As far as possible, try and keep this dedicated space only for work time so that your child knows how to differentiate. If you're stressing out about where to create the space and what to do about it, where in the house this could be done, there are tons of exciting ways that you can do this. Let me help you with a few things that you can keep in mind when you're creating this learning space for your child at home. The first thing that we look into is location. 
Select a space in your home that is free from distractions and clutter. Keep the space simple. Only have the material of activities required for that particular task. Try and choose an area in the house that is well ventilated and has lots of natural light coming in. Corners sometimes work well if the child has a tendency to get up and leave in the middle of the task. Ensure that this space is used consistently so that your child is able to associate with it and understand that this is a work time learning space. The second thing that we'll look into is the furniture. Make sure the desk and chair that your child is comfortable to use is available so that the child is sitting upright and has his feet firmly planted on the ground to maximize attention. The third thing that we'll look into is visual. Make your space visual. Use visual aids and pictures to communicate with your child. Lastly, and most probably the most important thing that you need to do when you're planning a learning space at home. It's about making the space very, very personal for your child. Make sure that the space plays into the interest and encourages your child to learn. For example, if your child likes something touchy, feeling something very soft, do a little spot, keep a little spot for it on the table so that your child will walk towards the space and have fun while he's learning. One thing that has made a big difference on how we teach while we are on how we teach when we are working with child's interest. This could be any kind of interest. For instance, I have students um, that absolutely love cars and have been able to attend and engage much better in class if the cars are involved. So this is what I do with them. To enhance their fine motor skills, I make them cut out car pictures from the car magazines. I might even use toy cars to practice counting. I sometimes also pretend to be a car to make them ro learn road rules and turn taking. As you see, there are so many creative ways that you can play with your child's interest and enhance their learning. The more you listen to them, the more you know about them, the more you know about their likes and preferences, they will be able to engage and learn better. I have always seen Vivian trying these things out with the kids when she's working with them. She's considering the child's interest and learning needs when she's planning a session for them. Let's hear her out. Hi everyone, I'm Vivian and I'm an early learning and intervention facilitator at the Owl House. It is an absolute honor to be presenting to you today and I would like to thank Autism Connect for giving us this opportunity. Today, I will be talking about various simple and practical teaching strategies to help make teaching and learning at home easier for you and your child. So let's get into it. I would like to share with you some of the common difficulties parents face while trying to work with their children at home. You know, some say, oh, my child does not sit in place or does not pay attention when I'm talking. Other parents complain that their child does not follow instructions and some even say that their child throws tantrums. Now, why does this happen? There could be many reasons why this is happening, but let's look at a few of them. So it could be that your child may not be able to understand your expectations and instructions. They may not even be motivated to do the activity or the activity in itself might be too difficult for them. Now, we have to understand that every child learns in a different way. And children with autism generally perform better through something called experiential learning. Now, what do I mean by this? It's basically hands-on learning, where your child not only needs to listen, but they also need to see, feel, and do to experience in a very concrete way what you are trying to teach. So let me give you a simple example of a kid that I work with. Now this kid is a visual learner. So we wanted to teach him how to set the table. And what we did was we used a placemat with the outline of the plate, fork and spoon to teach him this skill. Now, one of the worst things we could do for our kids is expect them to sit for long periods of time and follow instructions without experiential learning. 
which is very similar to what happens in our schools. Now, in order to make learning fun for your child, you need to understand what teaching style your child responds to best. Are they better with visual or verbal instructions? What are their preferences? What activities do they pay attention to the most? Then use your child's learning style to teach them new skills or to practice old ones. So there are three important P's when working with your child. Preparation, predictability and practice. Let's discuss preparation. For example, we might keep a diary with notes uh, for upcoming appointments or reminders on our phone so that we know what our week or month is going to look like. That way we are more prepared for it, which in most cases helps to reduce stress and anxiety. Now imagine you go to the doctor and find out that you need to have an operation, but they want to operate immediately. Imagine the stress and anxiety you will feel because of the lack of preparation. Now imagine in that situation, your friend calls to ask for your help or your spouse calls regarding some household problem. Do you think you would be in the frame of mind to calmly help them? Let's talk about predictability. Predictability means knowing what is going to happen next. So for instance, when you wake up in the morning, you know exactly what needs to be done. You know that you need to freshen up, make breakfast, get the kids ready for school, etc. Now think about the lockdown and how it affected all of us. Our lives were turned upside down. The shops were closed, the schools were shut, and there was no public transport. We had no idea what the following weeks were going to look like. Imagine the stress and anxiety we all felt because things were so uncertain. Nothing was predictable. Finally, and most importantly, let's talk about practice. Remember when you first tried to ride a bicycle and kept falling off or tried to tie your shoelaces? I mean, none of those, none of us could do those tasks well. We had to practice over and over till we got it right. So let's look at how the three P's tie in together. Let's look at, a, at an example of making a cup of tea. Now the first step is to keep all the items you need ready. This is called preparation. The next part is knowing the steps to make a cup of tea. For example, you know that you have to boil the water first, then add the tea leaves. This activity is predictable for us. And finally, you will only be able to make a good cup of tea after you have made, after you have made tea several times. And this is called practice. Now, when working with your child, you need to keep the three P's in mind. You need to prepare your child for what is going to happen. You need to help them predict what's coming up next. And you need to practice and repeat a skill till they are familiar with it. And then only can they become independent. Now, all these strategies help us to prepare our minds and bodies for upcoming events. This in turn helps to reduce our anxiety and stress and to stay calm. This is the same for children with autism, but the only difference is how we communicate the three P's to them. So let's go ahead and discuss a few strategies you can use to help your child understand and learn better. Today, I will be addressing the following strategies, building a routine, using visual cues, using aids such as timers, the first and then strategy, I do, we do, you do technique, and talk about a little bit about sensory needs. So let's begin with building a routine. So going back to what I spoke about earlier with regards to predictability, Building a routine helps a child with autism predict and anticipate what is going to happen next. Now, your child has trouble making sense of the world around him every single day. 
this causes him to be highly stressed and anxious and the last thing we think about when we are anxious is following someone's instructions answering people's questions etc the same applies to your child here is where a routine can help create structure in their lives and reduce anxiety that is caused by the chaotic world around them now you might want to think about different routines you want to teach your child for example their daily routine from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed or it could be something more specific like a bathing or dressing routine you might even want to teach them how to make a sandwich or how to use the microwave now all these routines have steps break down the routine into steps and do the same steps in the same order and in the same way every time for example making a sandwich is a routine and the steps are as follows first keep all the ingredients you need to make a sandwich ready then you can begin the task step number 1 put two slices of bread on a plate step number 2 apply butter to both slices step number 3 slice up the cheese step number 4 slice up the tomatoes then step number 5 put the slices of cheese and tomato on one slice of bread step number 6 cover the cheese and tomato with the other slice of bread and step number 7 your sandwich is ready to eat now if each of these steps are not done in the same way every time your child will not learn how to independently make a sandwich so the most important part to having a schedule is consistency which means repeating the same routine in the same order at the same time every every day of the week another example is teaching your child their daily routine like wake up make your bed brush your teeth have breakfast dress up and go to school Now you may have noticed that your children are more or less aware of this morning routine. This is because most of the time you do the steps of this morning routine in the same order every day. Now how many of you have uh, noticed that your children get confused when it's the weekend? This is because they are used to their weekly routine and get totally confused when it's the weekend. This is where my next strategy comes into place. using visual cues so imagine you travel to a foreign country and don't speak the local language how do you navigate around the city uh we will mostly rely on sign boards which will tell us where we need to go now when we go to restaurants you would have noticed that there are signs on the door to show us where the men's and women's toilets are or there could be a danger sign on a meter box which tells us to stay away from it even traffic signs which help us to follow the rules when driving these are all visual cues now visual cues are tools that we use in our day to day lives and we may not even realize it the reason why signs are used in addition to words is so that everyone even those who can't read will know what is expected when driving Now in autism visuals are the best way to communicate with your child. Visual cues are concrete which means that your child can look at the visual symbol for as long as they like and it does not vanish into thin air like spoken words do. You can write down rules and expectations for any situation. For example, if you want to take your child to a restaurant or you want your child to sit and do some homework activities. the visual supports will help your child to understand much more easily what is expected of them in different situations now imagine i was conducting this webinar in sanskrit and there were no pictures on my slides firstly most of you would not understand what i'm saying and so because of that you would not be able to pay any attention to me eventually you would all lose interest and leave Now imagine I said to myself how rude these people are leaving one by one I took so much trouble to put this webinar together Now what I didn't realize 
was that I was not communicating with you in a way that you would understand me. Then how can I expect that you will be interested in listening to me? So there are various forms of visual supports such as objects, photographs, drawings, or even written words. These supports can be used no matter what level your child is and how much language they may use. Visual supports will help you to communicate clearly with your child, what you want them to do and what you expect of them in a way that your child with autism actually understands. Remember that using visuals will help increase predictability, which in turn reduces stress, which could come from not knowing what will happen next. Now your child, you will notice that your child will show improvements in their overall behavior. Now there are various types of visual supports to let your child know about their daily schedule or the steps of some daily routine. Now, if your child can read, you can write the steps on a piece of paper. However, I very, very strongly suggest that even if your child can read, use pictures along with written words. Remember, people with autism think in pictures. Show them the steps of how to dress up using a visual schedule, using one picture that depicts each step. If you want, you can also use apps on your phone, such as What's Next Lite, which is a great app you can use uh, if you choose to use your phone to show your child the steps of a routine or even their daily timetable for the day. You can use visual schedules that are also drawn on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard. Show your child the task do the task and then once the task is completed, you can put a tick next to it. You can also use flashcards stuck with Velcro or blue tack, which is applied to a board. Point to the task, do the task and once the task is done, you can get your child to pull out the flashcard and put it in a box which is kept next to the visual schedule with the words finished written on it, just like you can see in this slide. Now my advice to you is, as soon as possible, make a visual schedule for your child's day. When your child wakes up, show your child the visual schedule. You can also divide your day into morning, afternoon and night. Remember how we talked about your child getting confused by not having school on the weekends? Please use visual schedules to help reduce confusion. Now when your child does not see the school picture on their schedule, they will realize that there is no school that day and they can play instead. So the next strategy I'm going to talk about is using visual timers. Let's be honest, don't we sometimes find shifting from one activity to, the, to another uh, in our daily routines a little difficult to manage? For example, after coming back from a vacation, we might find it difficult to adjust to going back to work. Or if we are in the middle of a pleasant activity like reading or watching TV and have to start doing housework, it will take us some time to adjust to this new activity. We might even procrastinate and say, oh, I'll just do it later. Children with autism as well can find it difficult to shift from one task to another which is why they need to be given enough time to process this information. Transitions basically mean moving from one task or situation to another. So we need to prepare them for this transition. Visual timers are a great tool to help with preparing for transitions. For example, if your child is watching TV and you want them to come and do their homework, if you tell them suddenly that they have to stop watching TV, you will notice that they will get frustrated and angry and they may not even follow your instruction. But if you use a visual timer, it will help them to see how much time is left and, you know, help them prepare their mind and body for the transition from TV 
to homework. Many children also have difficulty understanding the concept of time, which is why they can't sit in place or do an activity or wait for long periods of time. This is especially true when you want them to sit and wait without giving them anything to do. For instance, waiting at the doctor's clinic or sitting in church or when doing activities that they don't like, such as brushing teeth or doing their homework, etc. This is where visual timers come in handy because they allow your child to see very concretely for how long they need to do a specific task. Now, if you're telling a child that they have to do their homework or household chores for five minutes, but they have no idea how long five minutes is. So simply telling them, do it for five minutes will make no difference. This could cause, also cause them to feel anxiety and even some, some level of frustration. Now with the help of a visual timer, your child can visually see five minutes, how fast the timer is going and how much time is left before the activity can be over. They may still not like to do the activity, but they will understand how long they need to do it for. And you have a better chance of your child complying with you. So there are various timers available, such as sand timers, countdown timers on your phone, digital clocks with alarms. But my personal favorite is the mouse timer app, which is easy to use and can be downloaded on your phone. I've linked a picture of the app on the slide. Let's move on to the next strategy. It's called the first and then strategy. We all need motivation in some form or the other to do things. In some cases, the activity in itself can be motivating. For example, gardening, cooking, singing, etc. Others might be motivated to go to their jobs every day, knowing that they will receive a salary at the end of the month. In the same way, you will notice that there are some activities that your children can do for long periods of time, like watching TV or playing with water or playing with their toys. But for some activities, they may need external motivation, like doing their homework or helping with household chores. Now, knowing that there is a reward at the end of the task can push your child to put in some extra effort to get it done. Now, one way to help your child understand that there is a reward at the end of an unpleasant task, such as brushing or cutting their hair, or a difficult task like putting off the TV and doing homework, is by using a first and then board. You can make a very simple first and then board using either objects or pictures, or you can even use an app on your phone. I use an app called What's Next Light. I've linked a picture of the same in the slide. So how does this work? It's really simple. First, my task, then your task. So the first activity is shown using a picture or an object of what you would like your child to do. And the second activity is shown using a picture or an object of something your child would like to do. For example, your child say likes to play games on the phone and you want your child to finish their homework. Show them the first and then board and explain by saying first finish your homework then play games on the phone. Do all of this while pointing out to the visuals uh, on the first and then board. Also if you want to say uh, get your child to tidy up their toys before tea time Prepare your first and then board with two pictures, tidying up and their favorite tea time snack. Point to the pictures while explaining, first tidy up toys, then biscuits. Now remember, you are not bribing the child here. It's not a bribe if you inform the child of the reward before beginning the task. You are simply increasing your child's motivation to complete a task that they may not necessarily want to do. And don't worry, your child will not get dependent on receiving rewards for work. 
Once they are used to tidying up their toys or finishing their homework, you can slowly reduce the rewards and a simple praise like well done or a high five will suffice. The next strategy I would like to talk about is called I do, we do, you do. So let me share something with you. I take great pride in making a delicious chocolate cake. It's a recipe that my mom taught me. But what stands out about it is the way she taught me how to do it. I first watched my mom make it many times as a young girl. Then we made it together step by step. She did most of the work and I would help out a little bit. And over time, I would do most of the work and she would help out a little bit. Finally, I could make the cake all by myself. And this is a great example of the I do, we do, you do technique. First, my mum did the cake and I only watched. Then, we did the cake together. And finally, I made the cake on my own. I use this exact same technique when teaching baking at the Owl House. So you can use this strategy to teach your child new skills. Let's break it down. The first part is I do. Here you will do a task while your child watches. Let's take an example of a task like folding t-shirts. Make sure that your child is sitting in front of you while you demonstrate how to fold a t-shirt. Slow down and show them step by step. This will help your child understand even better and you can even use pictures if you want to demonstrate each step. In this part, your child only watches and you do the task. Now the second part is we do. So after a week, you know, you and your child can work together to fold a t-shirt. You can physically help your child to perform each step of the folding. In the beginning, you do most of the work and your child helps out a little. And over time, your child does most of the work and you help out a little. But don't stop using visuals for each step of folding the t-shirt. Now the last part is you do. So once the child is comfortable and has practiced how to do the task, they may be able to do each step with pictures while you supervise. Eventually, your child may even be able to do these steps without the pictures and without your supervision as well. This is when you know that your child is independent. You can use this strategy to teach anything like making the bed or setting the table or tying shoelaces. Now this strategy of teaching will help the child gain more independence and you might even get some help around the house. So let's move on to the next topic of discussion is addressing sensory needs. Another very important reason that your child may not be able to follow instructions or sit for activities or learn what you are trying to teach is because people with autism often have sensory processing difficulties. This means that they find it difficult to make sense of what they see, hear, touch, taste, etc. They can be either receiving too much or too little input. So some light that seems normal to us could be too dim or too bright for your child. Some sounds that seem normal to us, like mixers, pressure cookers, fans, ACs, could be too soft or too loud for them. Some fabrics like cotton or silk that we wear every day could be too irritating for them. Even some food items that we eat every day could be too bland or too spicy. It could be too bitter or too sour for them. Even cutting their hair can be painful or even scary, scary for them. And sometimes if you're using a trimmer, it can sound too loud. Now, because of this, many of your children may show hyperactivity. They may even be picky eaters. 
Sometimes you might even see your child closing their ears or looking intensely at their shadows. They may even not want to wear certain types of clothes and may not allow you to cut their nails or cut their hair. The, the problem is that they may not even be able to sense when they need to go to the toilet. You might even see them rocking back and forth, spinning, looking at the fan, smelling everything or even putting objects in their mouth. All of this happens because their brains are finding it difficult to make sense of the information that it is receiving from their eyes, nose, ears, mouth, even their skin, muscles, joints and even internal organs. And this is called sensory processing. Now, when we touch a, when we touch a hot cup of coffee, our brain immediately tells us to remove our hands and not to touch it again. When we feel our stomachs rumbling or our bladders full, our brain immediately tells us, oh, we need to eat or we need to go to the toilet. Say for instance, the label on our t-shirt is bothering us. Our brain immediately tells us, go cut it off. When we're cooking and we taste the food, and if there is less salt in the food, our brain immediately tells us, add some salt. Now we can do all of this because our sensory processing system is working quite well. However, your children's sensory processing system does not always work this way. Firstly, they may not even know what is going on. In addition to this, they may not be able to tell us that their labels are irritating them or that the food is too bland or spicy. They may not sense that they need to go to the bathroom and with these problems that they face, the last thing that they want to do is think about following instructions and focus on activities. Their only concern is to feel comfortable. So I'm not an expert in sensory processing problems, which is why I urge you, if possible, visit an occupational therapist who will help you to understand your child's sensory needs. And they will give you something that we call a sensory diet. Now following a sensory diet will help your child to feel comfortable and only then will they want to follow your instructions or sit for activities and learn what you are trying to teach. Now if you need help finding an occupational therapist in your area, feel free to contact us and we'll help you. So with this, I come to the end of my teaching strategies. Uh, but there are a few things I would like you to remember when working with your child. Always use visual supports when working with your child. Secondly, praise every effort, no matter how small it might seem. A big problem that I've noticed with Indian parenting styles is that we tend to reward the child only when he gets something right and not for the effort that he's putting in. Now, very often, we don't even praise our child and we might even punish them if they do something wrong. So, don't punish your child and don't shout at them because this will cause behavior problems. And definitely, no, no hitting, pinching or any form of corporal punishment. You know, your child will learn these things and he will probably do it on others and then it will be difficult for him to unlearn that. And another thing that I want you to remember is to praise yourself. Give yourself credit for all the hard work that you are doing. And remember, it takes time and practice for your child to learn. So I would like to conclude by sharing with you some of the common concerns that parents have shared with us when we have been in touch with them over the past few weeks. They speak about being worried about their child regressing. They have expressed being stressed about their child unlearning a lot of the skills that they have learned up to this point. And my response to them has been that it's okay. It's okay to take a break. Uh, we need to realize that this is a very stressful time 
for us and for our kids. And as we know, stress inhibits learning on so many levels. Right now, our kids are off their normal routine. And as we've discussed, routines for our kids are like a security blanket. So changes in routine can increase stress and anxiety, which does not provide a very conducive environment to learning. They may even display challenging behaviors like tantrums or meltdowns, which are depictions of these high levels of stress. Now, we as adults can find various coping mechanisms to manage stress, but our kids don't have these tools yet. So we need to be aware and considerate of this. So I urge my parents to look at the bright side of things. Look at the positives of this situation. So in this scenario, being able to spend so much time with your family is what we need to be appreciative and take full advantage of. Make this time with your family fun, play games, get the kids involved in what you do around the house. And this is also a great way to teach them life skills. So don't worry about the academic part of your child's learning at the moment. Give your child what they need right now in terms of structure and comfort to feel safe and be able to relax amidst all the chaos that is happening around us. And just enjoy your time together as a family. Thank you for listening. Uh, now over to you Priya. Once you have taught your child a new skill, how will you navigate or evaluate its progress? Our team at the Owl House uses prompt hierarchy model to analyze our students' progress. The model once understood is simple to use and will be a great tool to do small assessments at home. Let's look into the prompt hierarchy model a little bit. Like all of us, individuals with autism need instruction to learn. A new skill. A prompt is a simple instruction or a cue that is used to increase the likelihood of a correct response. Prompting can be helpful in understanding the level of child's learning. The prompts are divided into broad categories. There is a physical prompt, modeling, visual prompt, gestural prompt and verbal. So some students may learn a new skill quickly with minimal prompts while others may require more frequent and systematic prompting. A prompt hierarchy is a series of supports provided to help a learner perform new skills and behaviors. The prompts are arranged by the level of support they provide from least to most supportive. Let me help you with an example. Prompts help the student get to the correct response after or before the error occurs. Let me, um, let me take an example of John in my class. I asked John to find a picture of a table among the other visual cards that were available. While John is doing the task, I'll use a gestural prompt to help John right before an error occurs. Gesture like uh-uh, uh-uh, mm-mm, or any sound that will help John redirect. Now, instead of feeling intimidated by difficult work, John can feel like we are helping them through the task with some support. This will make John learn a new skill. Remember, unless a prompt is a part of the teaching procedure, we want to be very careful not to reinforce responses that needed prompting. Prompting can be so subtle and the child can learn to even be in tune with our facial gestures. For example, if current target for John is to select red car independently, and he needs you to point to the red item, don't provide reinforcement. You can prompt so that he learns the correct response and then come back to it another time. Now you may have questions like, how long do we keep prompting? How to know the progress if the child requires the same prompt every time? Let me introduce you to the concept of fading. It is very important to be able to fade prompts appropriately because we want to foster independence. It can be tricky balance between prompting and independence, but it's best to get the prompt out as quickly as possible. Let's support this with few examples. When I'm teaching John to touch his head, I would first give the instruction, 
the verbal instruction and say, Hey John, touch your head. And then I'll pair it with moving child's hand. I'll, pair, I'll take John's hand and move it to the head like this. And then I will repeat the instruction while touching his elbow and moving the hand up to his head and I'll say, John, you have to touch your head. Following this, I'll repeat the instruction while modeling. I'll touch my own head and say, John, you touch your head. Until John reaches correct, correct response. Finally, after some repetition and this prompt, fading occurs. So the child should be able to touch his head when given a verbal instruction. The next time I don't have to touch John, I just have to give a verbal instruction and John will know that he has to touch his head like this. This was a very simple example. On the other hand, if you've been teaching your child to clap his hands with a physical prompt, you might fade by modeling to clap and then continue to change your prompts while you're moving up the hierarchy. Evaluating a child's progress is not only important but necessary in order for the parent to know that if teaching strategies are employed, that, the, that all the teaching strategies that are employed are useful and effective. Let's review the types of prompt and how to use them. It's helpful to think of prompt in this hierarchy of an order. This, this helps for prompt fading as well as for knowing which type of prompt to use. At the bottom are the most intrusive prompts where the students have the least amount of independence. As you move up the list, the prompts become less invasive and the student's independence increases. Let's understand each of this prompt in detail. The first prompt that we will look into is called as full physical prompt. Full physical prompts mean you are physically moving your, child, your, your child's hand and body to complete the response. This is sometimes referred to as hand over hand prompting. If you want your child to pick up a toothbrush, you move their hand to the toothbrush and guide through the process of moving the toothbrush off the table. Let's look into the second one. The second one is partial physical prompt. Partial physical prompts mean that you are still touching the child but in this case, you are providing minimal physical guidance. You may touch the child's elbow to begin the movement, but the most of the movement is led by the child. For example, if you want your child to, to touch red, you would move their elbow in the direction a little bit and the child would then touch, the, touch red by himself or herself. Let's look into the third part, which is my favorite, is modeling. Modeling involves showing the student the correct response. If you tell your student to clap his hands, you need to clap your hands too and show the student that this is how you clap your hands. The next one is gestural prompts. Gestural prompting means giving some type of a gesture or movement that shows the student what to do. This could involve pointing, nodding, making an eye contact or looking at a specific area or item. For example, if it's your student's turn to participate in the conversation or answer a question from a peer, you might make an eye contact with them and nod, gesturing, oh, it's your turn. Let's look into the next one. The next one is verbal prompt. Verbal prompting can take many forms and even within this type of prompt, there are ways to increase independence. Verbal prompting involves providing some types of verbal language to use the correct response. A direct verbal prompt gives the exact answer. For example, if you hold out a flashcard of the letter F and say, say F, that is a direct verbal, verbal prompt. An indirect verbal prompt gives a hint without giving the full response. For example, when teaching how to water plants, after your student fills up the watering can, you say, where should we go next? That's one kind of an indirect verbal prompt. Let's look into the visual prompt. A visual prompt includes some type of a cue to the student on how to respond. In addition to the other natural cues that are available, such as pictures, text, photos, or videos. Visual schedules show students where and what to do and when to do. A written list of what to do when you are done with an activity can also be a visual prompt. Visual prompts can also be positional, such as putting the correct item 
or uh, required items uh, in a task closer to the student for example if mom says go to the bathroom and brush your teeth she may direct this activity by putting toothbrush and toothpaste out at the sink so that child knows oh this is a hint this is a visual cue that i have to use to finish my activity now remember our end goal is to make the child gain independence over the task let's look into what do we mean by independence here it's important to note that there are always naturally occurring cues before a behavior occurs it's important not to confuse those with prompts we want our students to greet someone when a new person enters the room right a new person entering the room is a natural cue to say hello a teacher saying hi say hi is a prompt the goal is for our students to respond to the naturally occurring cues to engage in the behaviors we are teaching them and that is what i call independence let's learn the most important part of this process of evaluation while we use the prompt hierarchy model it's called least to most prompting you can also utilize prompting through least to most hierarchy list in this procedure you start with the least invasive prompts and move down the list until the student can accomplish the task for example if you are teaching the student to put blocks in a bin you would start with the natural cue of hand putting blocks in a bin if the student still didn't put the blocks in the bin you would say please put blocks in the bin if the student if the student still didn't put blocks in the bin you would point to the blocks and the bin you would keep moving down the list until the student did accomplish the task as rightly advised by vivin you would keep providing praise and keep working with that prompt if the student puts the block in the bin when you provided the gestural prompt here we go you have your first prompt that you can begin with and then you will begin fading from there this procedure allows the learner to emit their highest level of independence and gives you a baseline for where his or her skill is again the prompt fading is a key here as staying with one type of prompt can cause prompt independence please remember that let's conclude this at home by using these prompt hierarchy model you can simply note down what prompt your child requires each time and can work on fading and gaining independence we hope these strategies and evaluation methods help you and your child to learn better at home we are looking forward to any questions that you may have for us thank you for joining us today it was great learning experience